This is CBC Here and Now. Confidence in Dwight Baldwin leadership? Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. Why? 100%. Why? He's a great leader. He's proven himself. I've been with Dwight since 2011. He's very confident in his leadership. He became aware of something one morning, and within 24 hours it was dealt with. Uh, I think that is commendable. These things are not easy to deal with. He's dealt with them. These are difficult decisions to expel a member from your caucus. Absolutely unequivocally. Yeah. He's always been a man of integrity and principle. I have more confidence in Premier Ball today than I did ever before. Tonight, a remarkable show of support for Premier Dwight Ball's leadership. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Our Megan McCabe was at the house today. She's been following it all. Megan, let's get right to it. As you just heard, those liberal MHAs almost eager to tell our cameras they're still backing Ball. That's after their colleague, Colin Holloway, told us yesterday that he's not so sure. From the back of the bench to the front, it sounded like these liberals were reading from the same script. Absolutely. I've been with Dwight Ball since 2011, and I stand to stick with him. I believed in him right from the get-go as a leader, and I still do. Yeah, and my experience with, uh, with the Premier is he's... Uh of all the politicians I've dealt with, and I've been at it a long time municipally as well, he's got as uh, genuine an, an art as I've ever met. He's a great leader. He's done some great things for this province. We're moving in the right direction forward, and he's taken a strong stand on the, uh, the events over the past few days. That resounding support doesn't extend to the allegations from some fellow MHAs about bullying and intimidation within the caucus. Um, when asked if they'd seen the kind of intimidation and bullying that Kathy Bennett, Sherry Gambin Walsh, and Colin Holloway described, they said no. Tense, heated meetings, especially at Cabinet, sure, but not what they'd call bullying. What I can say is from my experience at the Cabinet table and in caucus, I have not seen nor have I experienced. I have been at the cabinet table since, since the 31st of July and it has been a respectful table. Uh, no, it's not something I've dealt with or, or had to uh, deal with. It's not something I'm aware of. It's certainly not a conversation I've had. Did I feel it was bullying intimidation to me? No, but that's, you know, every person's different in how they interpret things, aren't they? Now, Megan, we haven't heard if PC MHA Tracy Perry has filed an official complaint about Eddie Joyce. Did she say anything about that today? She did. She says she's not comfortable with the process as it stands in terms of filing a, filing a complaint to the commissioner who then reports to the premier. But she has one ready to go. Yes, but I certainly hope that we're able to reach a uh, consensus that the more appropriate mechanism uh, would be the one we're debating right here in the House of Assembly today. And that is one similar to the Nova Scotia model, which offers uh, procedural fairness to everyone involved. The Premier can't actually change the complaints process because it's a legislated thing. So until that legislation changes, he'll receive the reports and he says that if everyone involved agrees, he'll make them public. And in the meantime, Tracy Perry says she's still deciding what to do. Anthony? Thanks, Megan. That's Megan McCabe live in our newsroom. Now, staying with politics, big question, where is former education minister and now independent Mount Sio MHA Dale Kirby? The embattled politician hasn't been heard from publicly since last Thursday. So we asked here and now's Terry Roberts to see if he could find Kirby. He joins us live now. Terry, give us a sense now. What, what's the latest? Well, Anthony, what you're looking at right now, this is uh, Dale Kirby country right here. That's the uh, provincial uh, district of uh, Mount Sile right here. But Dale Kirby, he's facing some pretty serious allegations of things like harassment and intimidation. So everyone in the media, of course, they want to talk to him. Everyone else is talking about him. But today he was nowhere to be found. So I tried to get some answers this morning by calling him directly. He answered his cell phone on the second ring. He confirmed it was him on the line, and here's how it played out from there. Yes. Hi, uh, Mr. Kirby, it's Terry Roberts uh, calling from the CBC. Just uh, wanted to check in with you. Uh, there's been lots on the go the last few days. I called back a short time later, and this was the message. The customer you have dialed is currently not available. Please try your call again later. At his St. John's home, a vehicle in the driveway the Canadian flag flying in the wind. 
but no one answering the door. You certainly won't find his vehicle in this parking spot. Kirby was removed from Cabinet, the Liberal Caucus, an investigation into his conduct underway. And Kirby's close friend, Tourism Minister Christopher Mitchell Moore, not commenting today. The second time Kirby has parted company with a political party. Here's Kirby and Mitchell Moore after their very bitter split with the NDP nearly five years ago. Now, I spoke to quite a few uh, Liberal MHAs today asking, uh, you know, about uh, Kirby's whereabouts. One of them said to me today, I just don't know. He's no longer in my caucus. I spoke to another MHA who said uh, he didn't witness any inappropriate behavior by Kirby, and he's just eager to see this investigation concluded so that they can expose the truth in this whole matter. Now, as for the other uh, uh, MHA involved in all this controversy, Eddie Joyce, so far, he's publicly refuted any claims of inappropriate behavior, but he wasn't commenting today. Now, what, uh, what happened late this afternoon, what came out of the House of Assembly, is that both uh, politicians, Joyce and Kirby, have been granted personal leave, leaving uh, this district right here, the district of Mount Sio and uh, Bay, Bay of Islands on the West Coast, without any representation right now in the provincial legislature. Just the latest twist in this ongoing political saga. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts in St. John's. Busy day for MHA Tracy Perry as she introduced a motion to develop a legislative specific harassment policy. I'll tell you how that vote went down. Coming up. Look who's back. Nice to see you, Ryan. Nice to be back. Uh, big thank you to uh, Colette Kennedy, Jay Scotland. Uh, that was a last minute. Uh, request to them uh, had to take some time off unexpectedly so a uh, big thanks to them uh, for a uh, pinch hitting right well you were missed yes so I hear <laughs> uh, there, we, we had a moment a couple of technical <laughs> issues and our apologies for that of course uh, so uh, uh, thanks to everybody who uh, it's nice to know you're watching which uh, is always nice and as you watch it this evening uh, a little bit of snow uh, to uh, uh, share with everybody, especially for you folks in Labrador. But let's have a look at the uh, webcam here. This is the last check in Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus one. Now it's been snowing for a good portion of the day in Happy Valley Goose Bay. You can see, though, the roads, at least the main roads here uh, in town, not really seeing any of that accumulation. Certainly the grass, though, looking nice and white there after that snow through today. We're going to see another two to as much as five centimeters through the southeast parts of Labrador overnight tonight. By Thursday morning, some lingering flurries there along the north coast of Newfoundland, uh, the Baver Peninsula, back into uh, central parts of Newfoundland along that north coast. Rain here across the east for a good portion of the day may even see a wet flurry mixing in can't rule it out for st john certainly clarenville bonavista and up that northeast coast for thursday afternoon as temperatures drop to the near the freezing mark in those northerly winds area of high pressure coming in behind and so there's some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of some sunshine for friday and we'll uh, share your friday forecast and of course tomorrow friday and the weekend in full detail coming up in just a few minutes anthony Thanks, Ryan. Well, it's a case of connecting the dots. Four men, four home invasions, and no positive identification. Well, tonight, one man is going to walk. Three others are in jail for the foreseeable future. Here now is Ariana Kellen reports now on the verdicts in the Paradise Home Invasion trial. That's Tyler Donahue on a court break after being found guilty. Until now, he's been free on bail, but he knows now he's heading to prison. Donahue has been found guilty of a home invasion here on Angels Road. There was a young mother and baby inside. The judge doesn't believe Donahue was inside the home or was one of the masked men. That was this man, Abdifada Muhammad. The Toronto native had a gun. The evidence says he and Donahue fled in this Mazda 3, tossing the gun, then running into the woods, later tracked by a police dog. This gun had DNA of a man struck in the head the night before at a separate home invasion. In the trunk of the Mazda, stolen goods from that previous robbery. With those dots connected, Mohammed was found guilty of two of the four home invasions. Why he came to St. John's is unknown, but he stayed with Mitchell Nippert while he was here, the common link between all of the men. The judge found Nippard may not have gone inside the houses either, but at the very least helped plan the break-ins and robberies. Guilty of two out of four home invasions. 
and that leaves Gary Hennessy. He was found near the scene on Angels Road, but that was about the extent of the concrete evidence against him. Not guilty. After saying his goodbyes, it was back to jail for Tyler Donahue. But not the end of the story. They'll face sentencing next month. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. A doctor who temporarily lost his medical license now admits what he did was wrong. Four patients complained that Dr. Adekunle Oalabi made sexual comments and touched them inappropriately. During his discipline hearing in 2016, Oalabi said he was innocent and one of the women involved was a pathological liar. Now a report settlement agreement posted on the website of the College of Physicians and Surgeons says he acknowledges he made inappropriate comments. It also says he's licensed to practice medicine again and gives his address as the Labrador West Health Center. To Ottawa now, MPs from all parties were visibly shaken after hearing that one of their own had suddenly died. Gord Brown, a longtime Ontario Tory, suffered a heart attack this morning in his Parliament Hill office. He's just a good man and <laughs> he, he was always there for all of us and uh, I just, I don't, I'm just at a loss for words, I'm sorry. But. I'll miss him every minute of every day. Brown had represented an Eastern Ontario riding since 2004. He served on a number of committees and did a stint as the chief opposition whip. Question period was cancelled today, so MPs could pay tribute. Gord Brown was 57 years old. Toronto police are investigating a bizarre scene near one of the city's busiest highways. This is what motorists saw on their way to work near the Don Valley Parkway this morning. A car dangling from a cable under a bridge. At first, police said it appeared to be part of a movie shoot, but no permits had been issued. The car is now on the ground and police are investigating. That is rather bizarre. Strange parking job. <laughs> now to a love story that's taking off. Two young people, C.J. Poirier in Clarkston, Michigan, and Becca Warren in Cornerbrook, are trying to meet in person. They met online last June and fell in love. But neither can afford a plane ticket to visit the other. They both work low-wage jobs. He's a barista. She works part-time at a movie theater. Now, in a last-ditch effort, Poirier tweeted Air Canada and asked... Just how many retweets would it take for him to get a free ticket because he needed one? He wanted a ticket to Newfoundland. Well, 530,000 turned out to be the magic number. Roughly, Debbie, I think that's one tweet for each citizen in <laughs> Newfoundland and Labrador. So the quest is on, but Air Canada has put an expiry date on this. It's May the 13th. Now, right now, they're well over 8,000 retweets. If you want to help them out, search for the hashtag 530K for Becca. <laughs> True love. Uh, yep, yeah. true tweet. <laughs> a few days ago, hardly anyone had heard of Whack Job NL, but now this anonymous Twitter account has the political scene's full attention. What we know about Whack Job NL coming up.
and intimidation. They have all been dominating our workplace for far too long. We've been talking about it for decades, about the need to put an end to bad behaviour. But talk is cheap when progress is slow <coughs> to come. PCMHA Tracy Perry in the House of Assembly today moving that the government bring in new anti-harassment rules and those rules modeled on what Nova Scotia brought in a year ago. Here now's Jeremy Eaton is covering that for us tonight. He is live at Confederation Building. Jeremy? So Debbie, uh, the MHA for Fortune Bay, Cape Lahoon, Tracy Pierce, she introduced a legislative specific harassment policy. So that's one that includes all forms of harassment, including cyberbullying and intimidation, two things that we have heard have been happening up here at Confederation Building. And as Anthony said in the intro, two years ago, Nova Scotia introduced a similar policy for its elected officials. And that's one that uh, encompasses MLAs, their staff, and even volunteers when they are working for elected officials. So as Perry said in that opening clip, this has been something that's been talked about for decades, but nothing has been done about it. And today? I felt um, confident that it is uh, something everyone uh, of us would like to see happen. It seemed clear to me throughout the debate that um, there would be support, which gave me uh, a comfort level that moving forward we will have a fair process under which to lodge our complaints and um, that this process will improve the legislature in Newfoundland and Labrador and hopefully other legislatures will follow suit as well. So all three parties and independent MHA Paul Lane uh, vocalized their support for it during the two-hour debate afterwards. Now as for Premier Dwight Ball, he says that after what's happened here the last couple of weeks, a lot of eyes in this province are on what's happening here at Confederation Building and he says it's time to be held accountable and that things must, must change here and that policies need to be introduced to allow members to go to work in a harassment-free environment. So with this motion passed unanimously, the work now begins to develop it and put it into place and that's work that will be done by the Privileges and Elections Committee. Reporting live for here and now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Confederation Building in St. John's. Well, of all the characters caught up in the bullying and harassment scandal, one of the most talked about is the Twitter user WhackJobNL. Yeah, catchy name. The anonymous account is the subject of police complaints from two MHAs, and rumors are flying that a political insider might be behind the keyboard. Here now, Zach Audi joins us now live with the story. Zach, even though this account is operated anonymously, as I just said, any clues about who could be behind it? Well, a lot of people are dancing around this, seeming to have their own suspicions without wanting to publicly point the finger. Yesterday, Liberal MHA Colin Holloway insinuated it could be someone close to the Liberal Party. What we can say for sure is that for more than a year, someone used this account to anonymously troll local politics. Its tweets range from sarcastic to vicious. Most of it is trashing the Conservatives and NDP and anyone the account perceived as hurting the Liberals' political fortunes. Now, WhackJobNL took some care to remain anonymous, for example, using advanced privacy settings and potentially even disguising their IP address before tweeting. But we can use data to construct a crude profile of the person behind the account. Now, we have collected all of WhackJobNL's available tweets, and as you can see, the account tweets most often during the business week Monday to Friday with a peak on Tuesdays. Now this next graph is time of day and when adjusted for local time, it shows that the account tweets most often around 6 or 7 p.m. Newfoundland time, so right after work. Now when WhackJobNL mentions another Twitter user, it's almost always to insult them. The accounts mentioned most often well, CBC News is number one, followed by VOCM News. After that, it is Lorraine Michael, Chess Crosby, and Jerry Rogers, so NDP and conservative politicians. One more stat, WhackJobNL tweeted an average of more than three times per day. That's a lot. Whoever was behind this invested a fair bit of time and effort. So for people targeted by a troll account, there's obviously a direct effect on them, but what, if any, effect do anonymous trolls have on the rest of us, Zach? Well, 
usually not much, right? A few days ago, most people would have never heard of whack job NL. In fact, the vast majority of people don't use Twitter at all. But over time, even little known troll accounts can have an impact. I spoke with Melissa Royal, a lawyer who frequently tweets about provincial politics. She says that anonymous trolls can shift the public conversation or media coverage of an issue. I think, you know, they, they contribute, although contribute maybe too, uh, you know, <laughs> too complimentary of a word, but definitely a part of it, you know, almost in a way that, um, you know, slipping a, an anonymous letter in a, in a blank envelope under the door of a news station in the past may have been, and that you're, you know, giving your opinion or giving some kind of fact you may know without putting your name to it. But the problem is, is that you don't have then editorial controls, right? Like a newspaper would not publish a letter to the editor without a name that was inflammatory and baseless. And you know, the CBC certainly wouldn't uh, post a comment that was, that was similar to that either, right? But with social media, a person can, can take that anonymous tip and put it out there with no one really to stop them. So th that is a problem. So as Melissa Royal is saying there, anonymous troll accounts seek to have influence without having any accountability. Now, Whack Job NL has certainly had some influence. We're all here talking about them after all. But whether the person behind the account will escape accountability remains to be seen. The RNC is taking a hard look at their tweets right now. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Why the province is warning a federal strategy on caribou won't work here. Peter Cowan has that story for you after the break.
welcome back. Once again, not a bad day for us, certainly this morning. Uh, what's ahead? Yeah. Well, well it's, ne it's never a bad day when he's back. No, oh, thank right? you. <laughs> except, <laughs> except what you're going to say. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so great day today on the island. Uh, clouds have certainly been building in, as you alluded to, Debbie, uh, with some rain pushing into the west and then some snow mixing in tonight into tomorrow morning even for folks on the island, uh, but not quite what we're seeing in Labrador today. May snow, good for sore eyes, right? Or a sight for sore eyes. I'm not sure which one or perhaps both. Uh, Kirk King, thanks so much for this picture taken in Western Labrador this morning. And you can see yeah, even the roads were uh, accumulating the snow for this morning as it was falling. Uh, temperatures still near one on the plus side in Labrador City. We're near minus one in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And that snow is pretty much confined to the southeast now. And as that system departs, we're going to be seeing a big temperature drop for the island. You can see where we're in the 7, 8, 9 degree range currently. But temps will fall as the winds shift to northerly. They already shifted to obviously northeast in Happy Valley Goose Bay, northeast in St. Anthony, northerly in Twillingate, and that northerly wind will wrap in to the rest of Newfoundland as this system trucks through through the overnight hours tonight. Seeing that rain pushing onto the western parts of Newfoundland as we speak. A little bit of mixing likely even as we speak for the northern peninsula. But again, the bulk of the snow is over the southeast right now. It moves in to the northern peninsula through tonight, dropping as much as two to five centimeters, especially for higher elevation areas. By tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., could see some wet flurries mixing in anywhere from Gander to Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, especially through the Bayvert Peninsula where we have the best chance south of the northern peninsula that is of seeing some accumulation will be again over the Bayvert Peninsula. Temperatures will actually start tomorrow morning in the three to five degree range for the southeast. A very chilly start for Labrador minus eight to minus 15 in Lab City to minus 12 in Nain. So quite the cold air mass funneling in on the other side of this system. Now, by the time we get to Thursday morning uh, around 11 to a.m. to noon, that wind will start to shift to north in St. John's and that rain will taper off the possibility at least of a wet flake, but I think the better chances will be Clarenville to Bonavista to Terra Nova and again back towards Gander uh, of seeing some of those flakes mix in. So we'll actually see temperatures dropping to around one degree for St. John's, Clarenville, Bonavista, Terra Nova will be steady near two for Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor and Twinlingate tomorrow and back through the Humber Valley as well. Uh, for the south coast likely dropping to the two or three degree range into the afternoon. The west coast we will see some clearing, maybe a morning flurry, Humber Valley is in Bayvert, as I said, but things will clear into the afternoon and that spring sunshine that'll turn the thermostat up into the afternoon into that four or five degree range. Uh, temperatures pretty cool through Labrador tomorrow, certainly far cooler than what you should be for this time of year, but lots of sunshine on the menu. And so I think we'll take it as we take a look into the Friday time period, a bit of a, some light flurry activity, maybe a, a shower mixing in with some wet flurries into the Friday afternoon time period that'll approach Western Newfoundland into the afternoon. Generally, though, Friday is a quiet day. Three to as warm as uh, six, seven, eight degrees along the west coast, six to nine for central and east, and even Labrador getting back into those plus side temps. Now, Friday into Saturday, this is when our next system tracks in. We're talking about more snow for Labrador for Friday night into Saturday and some gusty winds and periods of rain working their way onto the island. And we'll talk more about this with your weekend forecast in detail coming up in just a few minutes. This weather update is brought to you by the HCF Home Lottery. Bonus deadline is tonight at midnight. Get your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. The provincial government is raising concerns about a national plan to help caribou numbers. It says the focus on habitat won't help the George River herd in Labrador. That herd had about 800,000 animals at its peak in the 1990s. Since then, the numbers have dropped. Now there are about 6,000 animals left. Here now is Peter Cowan with what the province thinks would actually help. The federal government's report looking at caribou numbers across the country focuses on one key issue, and that's the loss of habitat. It's a big issue in many northern areas where there's development and mining happening. But interestingly, that's not the problem for the George River herd and caribou. 98% of their habitat still remains untouched by humans. The issues behind their decline are more on a natural cycle. About every 50 years, the population rises and falls. But the other big concern is illegal hunting. 
while they're at their lowest levels in, uh, in recent histories, there is a lot of unsanctioned hunting going on. And that is causing a significant human-induced reduction in the overall viability, the integrity of the herds. And that has to be dealt with. The province estimates last year about 900 animals were shot in the George River herd. That's out of a total population of just 6,000. The big concern is that many of the hunters are ignoring this hunting ban that's in place. For example, Inu from Quebec and Labrador have said they'll continue to kill animals, that it's an important part of the culture and food source for their communities. The minister says what needs to happen is the federal government needs to do more engagement to solve that problem rather than focusing on habitat reflect the unique circumstances to a unique set of herds and that is the circumstance of Labrador which needs protections other than habitat. The province is hoping to have more federal enforcement officers on the ground in Labrador that it might act as a deterrence to stop hunting before it's too late. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, just after tonight's show, I'll be crossing the street to head to Munn, where I'll be moderating a panel discussion for Autism NL. It's an important topic as young people with autism in our province grow up. It's all about finding housing options for adults with autism. Here's Tess Hemian with the Autism Society. Residential and housing options are a really big challenge for all those on the spectrum of all abilities, particularly for those with aging parents um, and aging adults. So what we want to do tonight is sit down and talk about what the solutions need to be in hopes that that can inform the new autism action plan that the provincial government is working on. Again, that's happening tonight at Memorial University in St. John's. Interesting guests, people who are on the spectrum, parents as well as experts. Hope you can drop by. The doors open at 7, so I'll scoot over there from here and out right at the end of our program. And it all starts at 7.30. This is a leadership issue. But every single one of us has to shoulder this responsibility. Since last week, we've heard of harassment and bullying at the House of Assembly, but what about in your own workplace? How does it compare? And how do you solve the problem? Next, a human resources expert weighs in.
It's been a chaotic week in provincial politics as allegations of bullying and harassment among politicians resulted in two MHAs being turfed from cabinet and caucus. It's not a pretty picture and it's got lots of people wondering about what it means for their own workplace relationships. Diane Ford is an associate professor at Munn School of Business who studies workplace aggression. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. What did you make of all the developments in recent days at the House? Well, it, it doesn't surprise me given the culture of politics, um, but also in terms of the culture that is shifting in everybody's awareness and what we expect and will accept within the workplace. Mm -hmm. So whether or not we accept this type of incivility or harassment or bullying, be it um, workplace aggression, people aren't willing to take it any longer. Well, you mentioned the culture, and there does appear to be a real shift in what's acceptable behavior, people, people's tolerance of that. But where do you draw the line in the workplace, whether it's private, you deal with uh, private uh, employers, or if in government between just normal friction and bullying, harassment. So normal friction is when it's about the task and the process and the behaviors and, and ideas. But when it becomes about the person, about attack about you as an individual, your values or who you are as an individual, that is unacceptable. And that is when you shift into this other realm of incivility or harassment or bullying. And bullying is when people are being persistently targeted. So it's not a one-off. It's not a one-off. Mm -hmm. That can be harassment if it's a severe thing, um, or if it's a low-grade thing, one-off is incivility. Mm -hmm. Just simply rude. Now, you are working with different businesses, as I mentioned. Is bullying and workplace harassment a big concern to them? It is, and it's, it's a definite huge concern. Now, there's a shift in terms of what people are willing to accept, and, and with that comes this idea of a psychological contract, of what employees are wanting in the workplace. We expect to be treated fairly. We expect to be treated with respect. And with better awareness, we are expecting that. And so employers are now having to address that. And we do so through policies and hopefully through training. That's the important part. And how are employers reacting to this? It seems like it's kind of bottom up that you're talking about. What about employers at the top? So employers are definitely going through the policy shifts. You see a lot of reviews going on. Um, even the government, the federal government, um, provincial government has gone through a review of policies. It will be implemented June 2018, which apparently isn't quite early enough. Um, but uh, you see a lot of that shift in terms of policy awareness and upgrading. Um, I wonder, in your opinion, is there a generational divide when it comes to this issue? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, my own research is that there, there have been these behaviors throughout the generations, but whether or not it's been seen as acceptable might fall along the different generations, yes. Diane, what do you think has to happen to resolve what's going on in the House of Assembly? To resolve that particular issue, as with any organization, you do need to have proper process and for there to be procedural justice for all parties involved. And procedural justice involves having full information, full disclosure, but also transparency for the participants in that, both the complainants and the respondents. So be treating people fairly throughout the entire process is a way to help with the healing and also in the way of to correct it. Hmm. Yeah. And we did talk about the cultural shift. Uh, how optimistic are you that um, the feelings that we've seen evident in politics and I guess in other workplaces that this can really change. The genie is out of the bottle now. It, it, it's, you're not stuffing it back in the bottle, mm -hmm. definitely not. Although there, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of training the skill sets that one needs to be able to deal with conflict properly in terms of supportive communication, but also in terms of the processes, how do you handle and help repair the individuals who are harmed in this incident? Because people who are targeted with bullying are harmed. They are, they are physically, emotionally, and just, they are certainly harmed. And they, so we need to heal so that it doesn't perpetuate. Hmm. Yeah. Diane Ford, we'll leave it there. Thank you so thank much you. for your perspective on this uh, tangly issue. There he is, <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Can never really get tired of this, it's too, it's too nice. They might not be tired of it, but Stan Cook's Sea Kayak Call Adventures me. is putting away the boats for good after nearly five decades on the water.
That's coming up. Let's meet our young athlete of the day. And this would be Faith LeDrew from Benoit's coach. She's 12 and has been running since she was eight. And to date, Faith has completed 20 runs, including four 5K runs to raise money for the Terry Fox Foundation. And this past year, Faith placed first in both her provincial and regional cross country running championships. Faith also plays basketball and soccer. Her dream is to, to one day compete in the Olympics for Team Canada. It's fantastic. Wow. She can add that to uh, the medal that uh, she was wearing there. Yeah. Busy young lady. So uh, pretty hot in certain parts of the country. Yeah. How about uh, if you have any friends or family in southern Ontario, I'm sure they uh, might be ringing you for bragging uh, rights uh, for today. Uh, obviously the hottest day so far this season, 28 degrees in Toronto today. Whoa. Even Calgary at 19, Fort Mac at 17, Vancouver at 15 degrees. Now St. John's the high 14, Montreal 25. So would Halifax it be, would it be fair 20? to say that the Leafs loss was rewarded by somebody upstairs who decided to make Toronto a pleasant place to be? Absolutely. <laughs> And also, uh, they needed great golfing weather, right? <laughs> wow. Hitting the links. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? They gave it the old good try, but uh, wasn't to be this year. The wounds are still fresh. <laughs> sorry, sorry, me. sorry, sorry. Yeah, how'd those senators do? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to. Now, as we take a look off to the uh, south, you'll notice on this last map, and I'll back it off, 27 in Oklahoma City, 11 in Denver. When you see a big temperature contrast like that, you know there's a storm brewing, and indeed, a big storm developing here in the U.S. Plains, and that is going to be our weekend weather maker as it tracks through our neck of the woods, bringing some snow and some rain, and here's how it all plays out. There's that snow tonight through southeastern Labrador, sweeping across northern Newfoundland with the risk of flurries through Thursday day and temperatures dropping back to the freezing mark in St. John's by the end of the day. Thursday evening into Friday, area of high pressure in firm control. Uh, that means a bit of sunshine in the mix. Now, later Friday and into Saturday, a little wave will push through with a chance of some showers and flurries mixing in. That's on the leading edge of this next system, which really the meat and potatoes of which will truck through Saturday. 
And we're talking about some periods of rain at times that could be a little on the heavy side. Some snow on the northern edge of this system, which I think will be a little bit more pronounced than what this model is showing. And that's certainly in the forecast for Saturday in Labrador. Here's the European forecast model ID. You can see it definitely has uh, the snow much more pronounced for you folks in Labrador. And I think the idea will be closer to this one where some accumulating snow back on the menu for you folks through Saturday in Labrador. That system will depart, and as we roll into the Sunday time period, a bit of a clear out, some lingering flurries, a bit of an area of high pressure will try to edge its way in from Monday into Tuesday. Be keeping an eye on that system, which at the moment looks set to uh, track southeast of Newfoundland uh, for that uh, Tuesday time period, Tuesday into Wednesday. So we'll keep you posted on that. Here's a look at that seven-day forecast, which does have some double digits in it, but obviously some rain in there as well. Saturday and Monday looking like the wet days and Sunday shaping up to be a beauty right now across Newfoundland. We'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. In Labrador, again, a nice day tomorrow, though cool. That mixing in with some snow uh, for you folks on Saturday and into Sunday. Monday and into Tuesday, uh, temperatures start to rebound. But again, a bit of a cool air mask trying to creep back in for mid next week. Well, it is a sad day for kayakers. Stan Cook Sea Kayak Adventures, they're calling it quits. That's right, after almost 50 years in the business, imagine half a century, Stan Jr. says the entire family has agreed that it's, it's just time to move on. Now, in 2016, I had the pleasure of joining Stan Jr. on the water in Cape Royal. Have a look. Stan Cook Jr., does this ever get old? The short answer is no. And besides it being beautiful here, there's no two ways about it, and the whales and all the stuff we get to see, what I enjoy the most is the people. Oh yeah, he's hurt. Can you hear him crying for help? He's saying, bring me the Texans. Oh, oh, oh he's like very, me? no, no, that's when they get ready to fire the poison. <laughs> I really enjoy tourists coming by and also the locals coming out and just experiencing something that you can't experience in a lot of other places. You might have known some starfish down there. Have you seen some little sea stars and stuff? There's snails, there's sea stars, there's a bunch. Oh, there's a lobster poppy lois. You, you can never really get tired of this. It's too, it's too nice. I almost appear to look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, team. Follow me. Woo! <laughs> that was close enough. <laughs> Tough gig today. And this is known as the Arch Deluxe. Arch Deluxe. Isn't this cool? One of the highlights of this tour and one of the highlights really of Cape Royal yes. is caves. The caves. These caves are locally known as the Devil's Nostrils and we can go in a long ways. But the thing about Cape Royal is there's 14 different sets of caves that we can go inside. So everywhere you paddle on the shoreline is a great little place you can sneak in, go inside, see different size caves, different heights, different depths. So it's really, really cool. Great place to paddle. It is a great place to paddle. Oh, it's Isn't fantastic. It beautiful. Right. So nice. And Ryan used his meteorological powers to summon up one of the most gorgeous days ever. <laughs> Pretty much. It was fabulous. Uh, yeah. I had the chance of going twice, so my wife and I went a couple of years earlier. Did you get paid that day? Uh, that day, yes. <laughs> um, one thing that for sure came through, and if you've ever been on that tour, the passion that uh, Stan Jr. and Stan Sr., of course, uh, had for their jobs. Yeah. Um, I They're had the nice. pleasure of doing that tour as well on a day just like you experienced there. Yeah. It was fantastic. Nice. Hopefully somebody else might. Uh, yeah, and my day will never that. come now. But uh, <laughs> anyway, good luck. It's, I know that a lot of people have enjoyed uh, Stan's kayaking over the years. Well, peacocks, they're uh, rare sights, except if you live in a certain subdivision in Surrey, British Columbia. There, these birds wander freely across lawns, rooftops, and they can nest wherever they pick. Some people appreciate their beauty, but others complain that they're just too noisy and too messy. And one man took matters into his own hands, and now he's facing a big fine. Mira Baines has the story. Peacocks are admired for their good looks and stunning plumage, but some Surrey residents have had enough of their bad behavior. Up to 150 exotic birds have made Sullivan Heights their home. Anytime they're disturbed, they start screaming. And it sounds a lot like a crying baby. I've gone into my kids' room thinking that they're crying at night, and it turns out to be a peacock. The wily birds are rumored to have come from a rural property in the area a decade ago and are now overrunning it. Kids are tracking it in. I can't send the kids out in the backyard to play. My kids never play in our backyard because our patio is full of poop. 
He says other municipalities classify peafowl as livestock and they aren't allowed to wander or they're taken away. Their perpetual pecking, pooing and distinctive hooting in the early morning hours drove one neighbor to take drastic measures. He cut down this old healthy tree without a permit because it was used by the birds to roost. TJ Shergill says he doesn't blame the homeowner for cutting down the tree. My neighbors, they, I heard sometime they had uh, scratches on their cars. Uh, two years ago, I remember one bird attack on my daughter and my neighbor's uh, kid as well. The move prompted Surrey's bylaw department to issue a $1,000 fine against the homeowner. The contractor and homeowner could also be facing additional fines of up to $10,000. We're going to continue with our investigation, looking into further legal actions and fines uh, against the, the homeowner and the individuals that cut the tree down. Ray Hall says the peacocks fall outside the scope of Surrey animal control. He says 10 years ago, the city tried unsuccessfully to remove the birds. And I think it was 2010 this was tried before and it did not end up so well. Uh, the contractor was chased out of the area, um, so that contractor is still, uh, <laughs> that's still fresh in his mind. It's not something that he's prepared to do at this time. Ray Hall says the city plans to hold community meetings to educate residents on how best to deal with the birds. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. Our viewer picture of the day comes to us from Western Newfoundland and in particular, Southwestern Newfoundland. I don't know. Southwestern, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, uh, uh, a little, how about this? So I'll yep. give you a big clue. This is a peninsula in Southwestern Newfoundland. Oh. Still don't know. Port a port. <laughs> Find port. out after the break. Port a port. Welcome back. The stage version of the Disney hit Frozen has just been nominated for a Tony Award for Best Musical on Broadway. Canada's Casey Levy is already drawing rave reviews for her lead role in the big budget production. Stephen D'Souza has the story from the Big Apple. No glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footprint to be seen. It's the highest grossing Disney animated film ever, with two iconic princesses, and the song, the one that's etched into the brain of every parent with a small child. Let it go, let it go, can't hold you back anymore. 
Bringing Frozen to Life on Broadway and transporting Elsa from screen to stage is the challenge Canadian Casey Levy faces eight shows a week. No pressure, right? And I thought, oh God, can I do this? Can I be this person that everybody wants me to be? Don't let them see, be the good girl you always have to be. So how does she do it? She takes her cue from the song's title. Ultimately, what gets me through every day is, is not thinking about it, like actively not thinking about it. So in a sense, when you're singing the song, you, you let it go. I do, yeah. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Casey has a voice from God. She really does. Not only has she made the role and the song her own, Levy has wowed critics and her co-stars. There must be Canadian water. When she grew up, she drank something that made that voice golden, lush, powerful. She's a powerhouse. Levy grew up in Hamilton. Her success comes as no surprise to Gary Smith. The theater critic cast her for a role with the Hamilton Players Guild when she was 17. Smith has since followed her career around the world and recently took in Frozen. I stood up at the end and I cried and I couldn't stop crying because it, it was, I was so proud of her and I was so thrilled that what she wanted for herself happened to her. She didn't get the part after her first audition. She was chosen after a new director was brought in, and the tomboy from Hamilton is now a Disney princess, living her dream on Broadway. There's something about the magic of being in a dark room with a bunch of strangers and getting up in front of them and telling some story and watching them be changed by it. Don't let them in, don't let the role of a lifetime that she shows no signs of letting go. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Well, now they know. Yeah, she can sing a bit. Oh, my goodness, she's <laughs> wonderful. It looks yeah. fabulous. Mm -hmm. Okay, who doesn't like a fireworks display lighting up the night sky? Well, one Chinese firm took things a little further, launching a spectacular light display using hundreds of drones. 1,374 drones, to be exact, lit up the sky over this ancient Chinese city. They formed various patterns, flowers, and popular slogans. And no small feat flying the drones for the 13-minute show, which covered a square kilometer of night sky. The display broke a Guinness World Record for the most unmanned aerial vehicles in the sky at the same time. Oh, that wow. That's, that a lot, that's a lot of joysticks. <laughs> <laughs> they also broke that record. Yeah, I guess so. That um, looks so magical. Yeah, that is... It's gorgeous. Wow. I would love to know what the price tag on that was. <laughs> Probably a wee bit more than a fireworks yeah. system. I, might think, so. Might I yeah. think so. I think so. Okay, our viewer picture of the day comes to us from, yes, Anthony Germain, the port of port Yes. <laughs> uh, so a big win by you. A little there. competition here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and getting, getting one for every thousand you give. <laughs> yeah, my batting average going up. Uh, so Amanda took this. I'm not actually sure from which community. Uh, no more detail than other than that was taken at the perfect time on the mm -hmm. Port of Port Peninsula. And thanks to Amanda for sharing that. And to everybody who's been uh, posting pictures to my Facebook page over the last couple days. That's think, a well-known that, surname from yeah, that neck that of the woods. That certainly is. Is that from Mainland, I think? That's my it's guess. It's a beautiful picture. That's my guess. Mm. Anyway, I'm, I'm sure she'll yeah, let us listen, know. Listen, maybe you're two for two. She, I'm going to go with you on this one. <laughs> let us know. Let us know. <laughs> yes. Great to have you back. Thank you. Great mm -hmm. to be back. Yeah, it, indeed. Anyway, thanks for being with us, everyone. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow. Good night, everyone. See ya.